As most of you have probably heard, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg just died. She became a Supreme Court Justice the year I was born, 1993, and it's been a consistent liberal vote since then. Now, it's a bit odd writing this report because I'm frankly torn between eulogizing and reporting. I think I hit a good balance though, so enjoy. Unfortunately, because in 2020 the light at the end of the tunnel is always another oncoming train, people are really fast tracking the seven stages of grief, skipping straight to anger, and if you're a Senate Democrat, bargaining. Because I cover the courts and Congress, my DMs have been blowing up with questions about Senate procedural votes like never before. Under any other circumstances, it would be a dream come true. So first, let's cover the basics. If Republicans can get the type of person everyone is anticipating will be nominated onto the Supreme Court, the swing vote is going to transition from Roberts to Gorsuch. More rights for the states, less federal protection for individuals. Of course, reverse that for guns and religious freedom issues. The basic appointing process for a new justice is quite simple. Trump picks a Supreme Court appointee and passes it on to the Senate Judiciary Committee, headed by Lindsey Graham. I want you to use my words against me. If there's a Republican president in 2016 and a vacancy occurs in the last year of the first term, you can say, Lindsey Graham said, let's let the next president, who it, whoever it might be, make that nomination, and you could use my words against me and you'd be absolutely right. Great. Thanks for giving me permission. And yup, you're a hypocrite. That message brought to you by Lindsey Graham. So Trump hands Lindsey Graham Senate Judiciary Committee the nomination, and they vote on whether to bring that nominee to the Senate floor for a larger vote. On the Senate floor, if a simple majority of the senators votes for that person, they're in. If it's a 50-50 tie vote, moderate, definitely not Christian evangelical Mike Pence will be the tiebreaker. So where are the opportunities to clog that pipeline? Well, unfortunately for Democrats, in 2017 the Senate changed their rules to include Supreme Court justices into the existing rules that eliminate filibustering for all other judiciary nominees. I know Democrats, the one time when you were ready to team up with your enemy for one last ride, the filibuster, it was unavailable. Similarly, I know a lot of people are already talking about Mitch McConnell and Merrick Garland. Back in 2016, the Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell refused to bring Obama's nominee up for a confirmation vote because uh, he's the Senate Majority Leader so he makes the rules. More specifically, McConnell created the Biden Rule, which said that a nominee couldn't be heard during a presidential election period. Sounds relevant. Well, it would be, except that he's still the Senate Majority Leader, so <laughs> He distinguishes this circumstance from Obama's because, in 2020, Republicans control both the White House and the Senate, unlike Democrats in 2016 who controlled only the White House. Hey man, whatever helps you sleep at night at this point. Yeah guys, it's totally different because in 2016 we disagreed with the other side. Now we agree. Of course, citing morality in this debate feels a bit like citing the Bible in a paper on evolution. You're bringing a lily to a gunfight. So let's get to the amoral strategies. While the filibuster nuclear option is off the table in this debate, some people are already talking about what I'll just call the doomsday option. It's like the nuclear option 2.0. You see, the House and Senate need to pass their annual budget by October 1st, or the federal government is going to shut down. Now, early Friday, Pelosi and Mnuchin announced that they had come to an agreement on this. But it's safe to say that the lay of the land has changed dramatically since then. Nobody has signed or passed anything yet, so the negotiation is still ongoing. Given the fragile nature of the economy, and considering that we're at the height of a pandemic, shutting down the government on October 1st would truly just drive everything off the cliff. 
It is something that the House of Representatives could use as a bargaining chip, since the Senate and the Senate alone are the only ones in charge of approving judicial appointees. Of course, if you were using this as a strategy, you'd either have to keep up this pressure until January when a new Senate and President get inaugurated and just hope one of those bodies was now represented by your team, or you would have to make a deal with Lindsay, you can use my words against me as I stab you in the back, Graham. Another strategy that we're hearing a lot more about puts the onus on average voters. Get four Republican senators to vote against the nominee, or three Republican senators and convince Mike Pence to vote against that nominee. Brace yourselves for a play-by-play -play of Susan Collins' every move for the next month or so. The final strategy that some are talking about is court packing, basically saying, alright Republicans, you get to put your Supreme Court justice in now. But we're going to win the presidential race, the senate race, maintain power in the house, and get rid of the filibuster so that we can start making changes to the court structure. Now yes, if one of those things doesn't happen, this plan is out. But I just watched Rocky and the Mighty Ducks last night and I am feeling super confident. With this convergence of many successes, the House and Senate could work together to change the number of seats in the Supreme Court and then have the President sign off on nominees to fill those seats. If that all sounds a bit pie in the sky to you, well you're not alone. This strategy is being discussed in two different ways. First as a plan of action. This is what we're going to do when Biden and a Democratic majority in both houses of Congress exist. On the other hand, some are treating this more like a threat. If Chuck Schumer can get the kamikaze in his eyes and just start plausibly threatening this stuff, might be enough to scare four Republicans into voting against any nominee until January. Really just channel your inner Donald Trump on this one. So those are the current strategies being considered by Democrats to obstruct any nominee from being successfully appointed to the Supreme Court. Unfortunately for Democrats, there just isn't a ton you can do as a minority party in the Senate without a filibuster. Now if I'm being straight with you, viewer watching this at home, if it weren't for the obvious hypocrisy of going against a rule I thought was dumb back in 2016 but apparently now everyone thinks is orthodoxy, this would be a pretty cut and dry issue. The president appoints someone and the senate approves them. Now at the same time as I've been discussing all of this senate strategy, I want to close out this episode by taking a moment to honor the legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in my own unique way playing the joke of hers that landed the best. This is from her nominating ceremony talking about her daughter back in 1993. In her high school yearbook on her graduation in 1973, the listing for Jane Ginsburg under ambition was to see her mother appointed to the Supreme Court. <laughs> The next line read, if necessary, Jane will appoint her. <laughs> Jane is so pleased, Mr. President, that you did it instead. It's no wonder that she was one of the few judges who could match wits with notoriously hilarious Justin Antonin Scalia. They were famously good friends despite not agreeing on anything, and even went on a non-work vacation together in India. I haven't even taken a co-worker to dinner. Now I tend to think of her as definitely opinionated, I mean read some of her fiery dissents on civil rights cases, those are your co-workers you're jabbing, you're going to be seeing them again tomorrow. But she also had a way of staying above partisan politics with a focus on objectivism in a way that I aspire to continue today. Unfortunately for Democrats, her absence will be felt almost immediately, as the Supreme Court has a full docket starting in early October. That includes the highly contentious case of California v Texas, which could legally invalidate the entirety of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare being heard on November 10th. You bet I have that one marked on my calendar. 
Now, to really close out this episode, I'm not Jewish, but I heard the polite thing to say regarding a prominent Jewish person's passing is, may her memory be in revolution. So, may her memory be in revolution. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello, YouTube. I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of, well, not overlooked in this case, but you get what I'm saying. Join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.